pounds over 20, over 20 years when I landed in Watamu and as the only doctor, I had to take the responsibility of managing snake bites since the only available antivenoms in the region were at Watamu Snake Farm. And the community knew that that was the only place to go when bitten by a snake. Um, this prompted me to research and uh, do a lot of work towards um, managing snake bites. I uh, have since participated and presented at local and international conferences and snake bite related issues. Um, this afternoon, we are going to look at um, epidemiology of snake bites, uh, morphological characteristics of venomous snakes. We'll look at uh, clinical presentation on snake bite and venomation. Um, we'll look at prevention and management of snake bites. Um, then lastly, we'll look at venoms and anti-venoms. Um, now, who is moving? Okay. Yeah, so um, from this slide, you can see, um, this was by Kofi Annan Foundation in the year 2017, when they had a meeting of African uh, representatives and the topic of discussion was uh, management of snake bites. And from this, this was what um, came out of uh, the Kofi Annan Foundation in February 2017. The large majority of victims of snake bites are politically voiceless, subsistence farmers and rural poor, displaced populations and children. It's up to the international community to be their voice. That was the late Kofi Annan, this foundation. Next slide, please. Um, so after that, a lot of things happened. Um, during the same year, on 9th of June, WHO formally listed snake bite and venoming as a category A NTD, which was a priority NTD. Um, the following year, the World Health Assembly adopted a resolution formally mandating World Health Organization to step up efforts towards addressing the global burden of snake bites. Um, on 24th May, the following year, the World Health Organization launched a global strategy for preventing, prevention and control of snake bite and, venom, and, and venomation. Um, the, the global strategy was aimed at reducing uh, deaths and disabilities of snake bites by 50% by the year 2030. Um, on 15th of August, the same year, Kenya was not left behind. So through the efforts of um, the division of NTD, uh, uh, we actually, some stakeholders were called and we, 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 we wrote guidelines on snake bite and venoming, which were launched at um, the National Health Summit in, on 15th of October, 2019. Uh, that is the booklet, oops, sorry. Um, that is the, those are the guidelines and they're available online for anybody to see. Um, so we we'll look at snake bite by numbers. The world population currently is about 8 billion. And uh, in the world, there are about 3000 snake species. And Sub-Saharan Africa has about it has 400 snake species and Sub-Saharan Africa has a population of about 1.1 billion. Of them, 90 are venomous, 30 are deadly. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa gets approximately one to one and a half million bites every year um, and up to 500,000 in venomations. And um, we get about 100,000 permanent disabilities and disfigurements from snake bites and over 30,000 deaths, which is not a small number for Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, when we look at the situation here at home, we have about 140 snake species in Kenya. Of them, it's only 13 which are potentially dangerous. Nine are known to be highly venomous. 10 can bite and cause a lot of pain, 
but they're mildly venomous. And as you can see, the bigger figure of 108 are non-venomous, and yet we are always killing any snake that we find around. Um, we get approximately 15,000 bites every year. And um, of those, there is about, about um, half of them, which is about seven to 8,000 uh, envenomations and between two and 300 deaths. But those are estimates, they could be much more than that. Um, this slide shows the knowledge of epidemiological data uh, throughout Africa. As you can see, um, it's only the countries, some countries in West Africa, that is Benin, um, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, and Senegal, who have a good knowledge. They have, a, they have established very good data on snake bites. But um, Kenya is one of the few countries which has limited knowledge, but there are some countries in Africa which have almost no data on snake bites. Uh, then I just want also to show on this slide the um, neglected tropical diseases versus snake bites. You can see snake bites in, in the whole world cause about 90,000 deaths out of two, two and a half million incidences. And if you compare that to schistosomiasis, which has about 5.7 million incidences, but it has only 15,000 deaths. Uh, when you look down the list, you see yellow fever, which has 2,100 2, incidences, but 100 deaths, and it's, uh, people talk a lot about it, um, but nobody remembers that snake bite is a serious problem. You can also see cholera has 178,000 incidences and 4,000 deaths. Um, there are there are five class, five major families of snakes. Uh, the first one are the colubrids. Uh, this is the largest family, accounting for nearly two thirds of the wild snakes. Majority are non-venomous. Uh, an example of of uh, the venomous colubrids are boomslang, which we'll look at in uh, the next slides. Uh, the second group are called boide or boids. Uh, in this group are pythons and boas. These are non-venomous and they kill their prey by constriction. The third group are elapids. Elapids include cobras, mambas, and coral snakes. All elapids are uh, venomous. Uh, the fourth group are vipers. And uh, this group includes vipers and adders. And all types of the snakes in this family are also venomous. The fifth group are the attractor speedidae, which are mainly burrowing asps or mole vipers as we call them locally. They are also mildly venomous, but they cause a lot of bites as we shall see later. The last group are sea snakes, um, and most of them are venomous. Uh, fortunately, we don't get a lot of bites from sea snakes. Next. Uh, again, if we go to classification, um, we have um, arboreal snakes. Those are snakes that live in trees. Um, the first group are the mambas. The second are the um, bush vipers. And the third are the colubrids, um, of which are represented by boom slang. Um, the second group are terrestrials, which terrestrial snakes which live on the, on the ground. The biggest group are cobras. Then we have adders. And then we have uh, so-scale vipers in, in that group. The third group has burrowing asps, which are atractaspis or more vipers. Um, the fourth group are aquatic. Those are uh, water snakes. So we have sea snakes there. And then we have also the water cobras or bulengerina. Um, there is also a classification by the snake dentition. So we have the first group are called aglypha. That means that 
the 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 oh thank you <laughs> aglypha those ones don't have um, they don't have specialized teeth and each teeth each of the teeth are similar in shape and sizes they are non venomous the second group is the opistoglypha which are back fang snakes like you see the the the, the fang here is longer than the rest of the teeth so these ones are highly venomous um, the third group is the proter proteroglypha which have front fixed fangs as you can see here and uh, they are also highly venomous then the, the last group is the solenoglypha which have front uh, um, fangs that collapse they fold backwards when the snake closes it, its mouth so they are mobile fangs but they are front fangs which are mobile and they can be quite big so that is that group of solenoglypha uh, when we look at the epidemiology of snakes, the disease burden is precisely defined. In Kenya, we have very little access to antivenom, as all of you might know. Um, we find there's many people with prolonged or permanent disability. Uh, these are serious economic consequences for individuals, families, and communities, and countries as, at large. Uh, they cause a lot of social, psychological, and emotional consequences for victims and their families. And it's one of the few diseases where one can be well in the morning and dead by evening. Uh, snake bites are relatively common in Kenya, though this is a very rare event in industrialized countries. Uh, snakes avoid human beings, but accidental encounters do occur. Uh, some snakes do hunt at night, and that's how they find themselves in the, in the households when they come in to look for chicken or water or food in the night, and uh, victims get bitten. There's what we call legitimate bites. Those are people who are bitten accidentally, uh, say when they're walking around or doing their uh, farming, uh, they're bitten accidentally, but then there are those people who handle snakes, and it's it, they, they handle snakes and get bitten, or there are people who keep snakes and get bitten. Those are illegitimate bites. Um, when you look at the epidemiology of snake bites, eh, there are snake-related injuries. Um, there is mechanical damage from fangs and teeth for the snakes which have teeth. There is envenomation and um, acute allergic reaction to venom. And uh, for the snake that spits, you have venom of thalmia where they spit. Uh, geographical distribution is very important because uh, not, snakes, not all snakes are found in all regions. Most bites occur in the wet season, early afternoon to early evening. Um, they occur in the first decades of life, affecting both male and female equally. Uh, most bites are on the lower limbs. Um, it's just about 50% of the people who see offending snakes. Uh, sleeping patients commonly suffer multiple bites because they'll be bitten and when they turn over again, they get another bite. Um, finger and hand bites are prone to necrosis. There is also what we call dry bites and it's estimated that about 50% of bites are actually dry bites. So about, it's only just 50% of the people who get envenomed. Um, so when we look at some solutions which can be achieved, uh, one of them is political solutions. Um, to make our politicians understand that uh, we, need, we need to put some funds into snake bite research, anti-venom production, and healthcare provision. Uh, we need also to improve on our, on our epidemiological studies to better define the problems in this country, e.g. the number, location, and species of snakes that we have, and the outcome of bites. Uh, we also need to use um, at least three methods of epidemiological studies, which are hospital retrospective, prospective, and we also need to use um, uh, household surveys. Uh, the country needs increased and adequate production of safe, appropriate, affordable, and effective antivenoms. We also need improved access to appropriate antivenoms. Um, we need adjunctive treatments, refining the current ones and finding new ones. 
Um, we need evidence-based first aid and medical management protocols. We also, as I said at the beginning, we, we need to educate our politicians and communities exposed to snake bites. We need to talk to the traditional healers and we need to improve the, um, the uh, education of healthcare providers so that we can manage snake bites effectively. Um, okay, now we shall move on to uh, morphological characteristics of venomous snakes. There are snakes that um, bite frequently and are associated with serious or life-threatening and venoming. There are snakes that bite frequently but rarely cause serious or life-threatening and venoming. There are snakes that bite rarely but are capable of causing serious or life-threatening and venoming. There are snakes that bite rarely and have not caused any significant envenoming. Um, other potentially venomous snakes which have not caused any documented bites. So looking at, at um, the first category of snakes that bite frequently are associated with life, serious or life-threatening envenoming, the first snake that we look at is the puff adder or Bites ariatans. Uh, this is a heavy bodied snake, uh, maximum total length of about 1.9 meters. Inflates its body and hisses loudly by expelling air through its nostrils when threatened, giving out a puffing sound, giving its name. This snake causes most of the venomous snake bites in Kenya due to its habit of lying very still and not running away as other snakes. It is widely distributed in the country. Um, okay, there is, af after that, there is one that I did not mention, I did not put the picture on, it's, it's, um, it's a so scaled viper, Echis pyramidum, this is a small snake, it looks like a puff adder, but it's a much smaller snake, but it's only found in areas north of Tana, uh, areas around Baringo and uh, Turkana, we, uh, there's a lot of snake bites from this snake, and it's, it's usually very aggressive. It's a small snake about not more than a meter in length. So now back to this, the other group. The next snake is the black neck spitting cobra, Naja nigricollis, which um, when it's aggrieved, it opens its hood and it can spit aiming directly at the eyes and it can also bite. It grows up to 2.2 up to meters in length and it's found all over the country. The next one is the Egyptian cobra, Naja Haje. This one, it also opens its hood when, uh, when, uh, when it wants to attack. Uh, this one is a non-spitting cobra and its bites are neurotoxic. It also grows to about, about um, 2.2 meters long, uh, found in most parts of the country except the coast province coastal region. Um, in the same category, the things that bite frequent and are associated with serious life-threatening and venoming are the black mamba, the dreaded black mamba, which is not black. The reason it's called black mamba is when it opens its mouth, the inside of the mouth is black. It has a coffin-shaped head. It's, most of the specimens are gray in color and uh, it can grow up to two meters in length. And it's a very fast, agile, and uh, nervous snake. It moves very fast. And its bites are very, very serious. So, and it's found in most parts of the country. Uh, the other one in that group is the green mamba. Uh, it's not, it's, its uh, venom is not as potent as the, the black mamba, but it, it uh, also bites quite a few people, the drastis and gastriceps. It's mainly found in um, central Kenya and along the coastal region, it grows up to two, two meters. Um, the next one is the Jameson's mamba. This one, it's, it's green, but with black spots, can also grow up to two meters long but it's only found in, um, in Western Kenya, the Kakamega forest. 
Um, okay, the second category are snakes that bite frequently but rarely cause serious or life threatening envenoming. This particular specimen, um, the burrowing asp, there's Atractaspis microlepidota and uh, Atractaspis vibrione, which cause a lot of bites. There are shots, there's uh, snakes which are about a meter long with a very stout neck, a very stout head and neck. Um, and they live in burrows, that's why they're called burrowing asps. Uh, most of the time when it rains, they're washed away by the rain and that's how people get uh, encounter them and get bitten. Uh, they are also found all over the country. Uh, the next one is the rhombic night adder, uh, which is also uh, it's causes rhombiatus. It's found in um, Mount Kenya region and uh, it grows up to about a meter long. It also bites frequently, but doesn't cause any serious envenoming, and there's no antivenom for them. Next, please. Um, the next category are uh, snakes of that group are boomslam, this folidas tipus. Um, this is uh, a snake which causes bleeding syndrome, also grows up to one meter long. There are different colors between male and female. The male is usually green, the male is brown in color, the female is brown in color. And um, it's found in most parts of the country except central Kenya. Um, the next one is the forest cobra, Naya subfulva, which again is also found in many parts of the country. Um, the next one on the list is uh, the gaboon viper. This is a very big snake. It can grow up to two meters tall, long. Um, it, has a, it can have a girth of up to five centimeters. Um, it has very long fangs. No, it has very long fangs. Um, and uh, they can grow up to five centimeters, actually, the, the, the fang, sorry. Uh, it's only found in areas around Kakamega Forest. Um, the next one in this group of the snakes that bite rarely is um, Hallowell's bush viper, which is Atheris squamigera. It's also found in Western area, um, again, in Mount Kenya, M M sorry, Mount, um, Mount Kakamega Forest. Next, please. And uh, the third category are snakes that rarely bite but are capable of causing severe or life threatening envenoming. Um, that is the Norse horned viper, Bites nasiconis. It also looks like a puff adder, but it's much smaller in size. And again, it's also found in, in, um, in areas around Kakamega Forest. Uh, then in this group is also the coral snake, Aspidalaps lubricus. Um, it grows up to one meter. This one is found mainly in the coastal regions. Um, the fourth category are snakes that bite rarely and have not caused any significant envenoming. The one of them is the forest night adder. Um, the forest night adder is also found mainly in Western Kenya. It's, it grows up to about a meter long. Um, then um, the other one is the East African gutter snake, Lapsoida lovirege. This one is found in areas around Nairobi and, um, uh, and central Kenya regions. Doesn't bite very often, but um, quite an, it's killed many times. Next, please. Uh, other potentially venomous snakes which have not caused any documented bites are the Kenyan mountain viper, Montateris hindi. This one is found in areas around Mount Kenya again. Um, the prickly bush viper, Atheris hispida. Uh, this one is found in areas around Kakamega Forest. The velvet green night adder, causes resimus, is also found in areas um, in. Western Kenya and around the coastal region. So the, now we'll talk about cl clinical presentation of snake bites. Um, the, they present as fang and tooth trauma. 
and envenomation. The resulting traumatic wound is usually very minor. Sometimes you might not see it. Uh, like all snake bites, patients who come to see you with snake bites are really, really frightened. Um, when, especially when they believe they've been bitten by a seriously venomous snake and they think all snakes are venomous. Uh, vomiting occurs most commonly in mamba bites. There are three distinct clinical syndromes. The first one is painful progressive swelling due to injected cytotoxic venom. Uh, the second one is progressive weakness due to neurotoxic venom. The third is bleeding due to hematoxic venom because there are three types of venoms that we shall look at later. Then there is an overlap. So it is possible to uh, manage a patient without really having seen the patient by uh, syndromic management without, sorry, without having identified the offending snake. Um, okay, now this is an algorithm of clinical presentation of a patient with a possible snake bite. The snake may have been seen, felt, puncture wound, but is not or in compatibility with any other etiology. If the patient is clinically normal, then possibly it's early envenomation and not a snake bite, or the patient is not envenomed. As because we, I told you that about 50% of the bi of bites are dry bites. Um, if there is collapse within five minutes, then probably the envenomation is in an infant or there could be an acute allergic reaction to venom. This is a patient who has previously uh, been in contact with snake venom. Or if um, venom is injected intravascularly. Uh, if the patient doesn't collapse within Oh, I've lost the screen. Dr. Irulu, we've lost yes. you. I can't yeah, I've hear. Lo I've, I've lost yeah. the screen. Oh, sorry. I've lost oh, the screen. Okay. <laughs> At some point, we were not hearing anything. So we thought we've lost you completely. Oh, yeah. I lost the screen. I don't know. Now, Dr. Tari, people are yes. asking for your, for your slides a lot. Eh? But yeah. uh, as usual, we have this session recorded and it's going to be available on our KNH website. Uh, maybe yeah. you can share the link for the guideline book on the chat so that people can download, but I'm yeah, sure yeah. it's easily accessible on the websites for it is. Yeah. It is yeah. 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 So what is happening? <laughs> oh. Oh, wow. the IT, IT, but uh, IT. I can see you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we can continue. Eh? So, um, yes, please. Our... Yes, please. Yeah, I was saying that, um, you see now, if the patient doesn't collapse within five minutes, uh, then you will get a mixture of, it will either be uh, painful progressive swelling, which you can check out for progressive weakness or mixed painful progressive swelling and progressive weakness, or there'll be the bleeding syndrome. So you can look out for any of the three syndromes. Next slide. Next, please, we are stuck on, <laughs> okay. Now, painful progressive swelling. Um, it occurs in about 90% of the bites. Um, you'll get it in puff adder bites, gaboon, bi uh, gaboon adders, spitting cobras, mole vipers, so scale uh, vipers or carpet vipers. And the bite sites, from the bite sites spreading, it spreads proximal, in the proximal direction. If it spreads for five to 15 centimeters per hour, 
um, that happens in puffada bites and one to two centimeters in spitting cobra bites. Um, it would it would take uh, the swelling would continue for two to seven days in puffada bites if untreated. Locally, you would find pain and swelling on on onset, immediate blistering, hemorrhage, edema, tissue necrosis, uh, ecchymosis um, due to uh, PL2 enzymes and metalloproteinases. Uh, hematologically, you would see co coagulation defects, spontaneous bleeding, thrombocytopenia, hematemesis, epistaxis, um, GIT bleeding, internal hemorrhage. You, patients would get anemic secondary to bleeding and hemolysis. Uh, on pulmonary, in the lungs, you, you, there's a possibility of pulmonary edema, tachypnea, dyspnea. Cardiovascular system, symptoms would be hypotension, cardiac arrhythmia, tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, sometimes might lead also to cardiac arrest. Um, in the renal, uh, in the kidneys, you might find the patient has hemat hematuria, hemoglobinuria, myoglobinuria, or renal failure. Uh, generally, uh, you would find the patient has nausea and vomiting, fever, abdominal pain, regional lymphadenopathy, and in some specific snakes like the spitting cobra, you'd find drowsiness. Um, you might be able to identify one or two uh, fang marks uh, or scratches, small lacerations, and sometimes you might not be able to see the, the fangs or the fang marks. Um, locally, complications of painful progressive swelling would be blisters, necrosis, abscesses, deep hematoma. Regionally, you'd find compartment syndrome, pain on passive stretching, pain on out of proportion, pulselessness, pallor, paresthesia, paralysis. Uh, you might also find vessel and nerve entrapment syndromes and DVT. Um, systemically, the patient will have hypovolemia, anemia, hypoalbuminemia, hypofibrosis fibrinogenemia, cardiotoxicities, and pulmonary edema, especially in the Gaboon viper bites, bleeding, uh, thrombocytopenia, and sometimes you find patients with consumption coagulopathy. The late complications are chronic ulcers and malignancies. Yeah, now these are the complications of painful progressive swelling. Um, this is an example of a patient who did not um, was not attended to in time or didn't get antivenom wherever he may have gone. So that is what, those are the complications you get. That is another, another on which if left like this, the patient is likely to lose his, his foot because of that. Yeah, that's another complication. This patient, you can see the, the foot is already, it's, it's, it's almost dead. It needs, you probably require amputation sooner. Um, now, uh, when we look at the clinical severity score for edema, uh, there are five grades of edema. Grade one, uh, the swelling does not pass the wrist rankle joint. Uh, that's if a patient is bitten on the hand or, or foot. Uh, grade two does not pass major joint, which could be the elbow or the knee. Uh, grade three extends past a major joint. Grade four reaches, but does not exceed the base of the limb, which is the shoulder and hip. Um, grade five, extensive edema beyond the base of the limb. Now, this is a patient that I saw at um, uh, Malindi Hospital some years back. He got bitten on the finger here. And as you can see, he developed blisters in the elbow and those progressive swelling. So this is painful progressive swelling. And he, has, he had actually been, he identified the snake, which was a papada. And as you can see, the swelling had already progressed quite a bit by the time he came to hospital. So this is, this is grade five, because you can see it has gone beyond, beyond, it's gone up to there, the swelling all the way from the limb up to beyond the shoulder joint, and it's all here. So that is grade five for envenomation.
This is another one was beaten by Pafada, again on the arm here. As you can see, the swelling was progressing, but he got antivenom and, and recovered quite well. Same patient here. Um, this was a patient I also saw at Malindi Hospital, but he had been, this one was beaten by a uh, mole viper, a tractaspis, microlepidota. Unfortunately, these ones, there's no antivenom for this particular snake, so you just have to treat symptomatically and uh, just to watch out that he's, he's not going to have any uh, edema that is going to obstruct his airways. So he was kept in hospital, but recovered fully. Uh, this is a patient also I saw what, this one was bitten on the toe by again, the mole viper. I told you this, this snake bites quite frequently, but uh, when it bites the toe, it's prone to, to necrosis. But um, so the next slide, please, will show what happened. So that's the same patient, but that is already a recovery. You can see the. Fortunately, he didn't lose his 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 um his toe. So now uh, the second syndrome is progressive weakness. Um, this is usually, um, it's, it's bites from mambas and non-spitting cobras. Um, you will get muscle dysfunction leading to respiratory failure and non-spitting cobras um, produce uh, postsynaptic toxins via lymphatics, but mambas produce excessive circulating ac acetylcholine levels direct into the bloodstream. Um, the eventual, um, outcome is flaccid paralysis. Um, the black mamba can also produce a muscle fas fasciculation, excessive salivation. In fact, you'll get a patient with um, thick, stringy saliva, difficulty in swallowing, nausea, vomiting, pinpoint pupils, loss of sensation in hands and feet, chest pain, abdominal cramps, and loss of bladder and bowel functions. Um, the in the non painful swelling with uh, sorry, black mambas will produce a non -painful, non painful swelling, but non spitting cobras might produce a painful progressive swelling. Wow. Okay, now, um, so if you get the pre uh, clinical presentation of, of a patient who presents within a few minutes with perioral paresthesia, pins and needles, the hands, feet, excessive salivation, excessive sweating, followed by restless, restless, restless progression of weakness, respiratory failure within an hour, and um, it, could be, it, it could be one of the mambas. It could be the black mamba or green mamba. Symptoms might be less in the green mamba, but there would be similar symptoms. Uh, that comes very fast. If there is a little bit of delay and it happens within one hour, the patient feels unwell, local tender, swelling, possible window period before onset of weakness, respiratory failure, then most likely it's a non-spitting cobra, which could have caused that. But it's also important to note the geographical distribution of the snakes, because there are some, as we said, as I said earlier, there are some snakes that are not found in particular regions. Uh, tonicase and antivenom may delay or prevent respiratory failure. Um, yeah. We previously we thought that the forest cobra bites were known, but uh, we've been having uh, hearing quite an, uh, a lot about uh, patients being bitten by forest cobras, which are neurotoxic. Uh, now, this is the clinical, the grading again of uh, neurotoxicity. Uh, grade one, anesthesia, tingling, and local itches. Grade two, drooping of the eyelids, visual, hearing, and swallowing disorders. Um, grade three, increased production of saliva and sweating, vomiting. Grade four, respiratory distress syndrome, and inability to talk. So those are the... So, uh, one of the major symptoms in neurotoxic envenoming is ptosis. If you ask the patient to open his eyelids or look up, 
he's unable to use that because these muscles are paralyzed. He's not able, it's usually the beginning of neurotoxic envenomation. Envenomation, that's what we need to look out for. Now, this patient already is, has progressed into excessive salivation. You can see there's a lot of saliva coming out. And as you can see, the eyes are drooping. She's already dripping into semi-comatose. Uh, this is another patient, similar symptoms like the lady. And see the saliva is coming out of the mouth, the nose, and the eyes are drooping, pinpoint pu pinpointed pupils. Um, this is one patient that I'm always proud of. We, he's a, when he came to us, he was 13 years old. He had just been beaten about 45 minutes before he came to us. Uh, by this, he descri described the snake as a long gray snake. And within 45 minutes, he had developed most of the symptoms of envenomation. But we had, luckily enough, we had antivenom and we managed to keep him, uh, we managed to keep him oxygenated with um, an ammo bag. And uh, we actually saved his life. So it is not out of the blues. You don't need very sophisticated things. And that was him the following day. Uh, those are his parents. Uh, this was my late friend, unfortunately. And this lady, they all passed away, but they used to run the snake farm at that time. And that was me. Yeah, and that was the team that saved. They brought the antivenom and we gave. Uh, bleeding syndrome, um, it's, the main culprit, the snake that bites quite a bit is boom slang. Um, but there is also a, a snake called the twig snake, but it rarely bites and they have minimal swellings. The so scaled viper can cause both painful progressive swelling and bleeding as well. So this is due to activation of factors two, uh, 10 and nine. Uh, it's also common with the puff adders and gaboon vipers which have an enzyme gabonins, which converts fibrinogen to fibrin, or gabonin, which prevents platelet aggregation. And they have, there are also hemorrhages which damage the blood vessel linings and cause bleeding. Um, there are toxins which cause a lot of integrity of blood cap capillaries. And patients with bleeding syndrome can bleed from all orifices. Uh, this is the clinical, Severity score for bleeding. Grade one is persistent local bleeding from bite wound, greater than an hour. Grade two is bleeding from old cuts and wounds. Uh, grade three, spontaneous bleeding from healthy mucosa. Grade four is externalization of internal bleeding. Um, that is hematemesis and melena. And grade five is cerebral, meningeal, or intra abdominal or retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Um, this is also. A patient that I was involved in, he was bitten on the arm at home. Then the wound never stopped bleeding. He was taken to a local health center. But um, since he couldn't get help immediately, he wanted to go home. But fortunately, the clinician there insisted that he must go to a host to, to, to a major hospital. He was taken to Kilifi Hospital, where after being seen and they did. Um, they did the test and, and we confirmed that it was, it was, he had bleeding syndrome and he was given antivenom and survived. Yeah, so this is clinical presentation of the bleeding syndrome with severe envenomation and uh, significant painful progressing swelling. So if, if there is progressive painful swelling, uh, thrombocytopenia without coagulate, without um, consumption coagulopathy, then it's a puffada bite. If there is no, uh, if there is consumption coagulopathy, then you think about a Gaboon Viper, in case of early fainting, dyspnea, pulmonary edema. Um, if this is not there, then you think about a black neck spitting cobra. On the other hand, if the blood is incoagulable and there is a minor swelling, then you think about mainly the boom slime because the vine snakes rarely, you get rarely rare bites from that. But again, it all depends on the geographical area where you are. 
which is very important. So this is differential, different, differential diagnosis of snake bites. If there is immediate local pain and one of, or more puncture marks, this could actually be conflicts, rodent bites, bites and stings by arthropods, and in water, fish bites, and spine pricks. But everybody, as we said, 50% of the people only see what the snake. So the other 50% would come with all these kind of things and, and still think that they have been bitten by a snake. So you really have to examine them properly um, and take proper history. There is, if there is immediate local pain and one or more puncture marks with mild local swelling and severe systemic symptoms, there could be stings by scorpions, spiders, and centipedes. And if there's local swelling, inflammation, resulting in hot red swollen limb with enlarged lymph, regional lymph nodes, there could be cellulitis, or uh, there could be spider bites, Sometimes, uh, and if, but those normally take about 24 hours to develop. But in case it develops earlier, it could actually, the interval might be early in cat and dog bites. Okay, next, please. So now we'll go to the next, which is prevention and um, prevention of snake bites. It's important to learn when and where snakes may be found. Snakes rest in cool shaded places during hot weather. Snakes are predatory carnivores, but avoid confrontation with larger animals. They'll always try and run away. Never handle or threaten or attack a snake, especially in an enclosed place. It will feel threatened and it will attack you. Um, just like the lead Michuki used to say, don't rattle a snake. If it's an in a closed place, it will certainly attack you. Um, do not put your feet, your hands or feet in holes, nests you cannot see. Most snake bites occur during rainy season, plowing and planting and harvesting. That's when the snakes also come out uh, to look for food. Leave snakes alone. Do not try to catch or frighten or attack a snake. Back away and do not touch, try to touch the snake. They'll always move away from you in the opposite direction if they see you. Do not pick up a snake that appears to be dead. There are some snakes which are known to look like they're dead, but they will actually bite you. This particular species is found, they're called wrinkles, they're found in South Africa. Um, learn what venomous snakes look like. Venomous snakes are born fully equipped with venoms and fangs, whether they're young or not. <laughs> Dress to protect yourself. Uh, always check your footwear before wearing them. Next, please. Um, indoors, please do not keep livestock in the house. There are people who keep chicken in the house, eggs. So snakes will actually come looking for food and they will get into the house. Regularly check the house for snakes. Store food in rat proof containers, seal any rats and holes. Keep animal feed and rubbish away from animals. Keep plants away from doors and windows. Do not have tree branches touching the house because there are very many snakes which live on trees and they can easily slither into the, into the house. Keep the grass around the house short. Snake repellents do not work at all. This is a snake repellent that is is actually sold out there and um, it's been tried and tested and I can assure you that it does not work at all. So don't waste your time with snake repellent. Um, recommended first aid methods. Reassurance is very important because most of the time the patients are very frightened. Um, they need to be mobilized because they are really panicking. Pressure immobilization is important for neurotoxic bites. Um, if a patient has got uh, cytotoxic, confirmed as cytotoxic finger bites, immediate elevation of the involved arm with active flexion extension for five minutes can help to spread the venom in the finger so that um, if there is, you don't have uh, necrosis happening. Leave the wound alone. Do not try to kill the snake. Don't waste time trying to look and kill the snake. Transport the patient to the hospital as soon as you can. Uh, principles of first aid. 
The aims, first aid treatment is carried out immediately or very soon after the bite before the patient reaches a dispensary or hospital. It can be performed by a snake bite victim himself or by anyone who is present and able. Unfortunately, as you will see, many of the traditional and popular avail and available and affordable first aid methods have proved to be useless or even frankly dangerous. Um, the aims of first aid are an attempt to retard the systemic absorption of venom, preserve life and prevent complications before the patient can reach medical care, control distressing or dangerous early symptoms of venoming, arrange transport of, of patients to, to a place where they can receive medical care, but above all, do not do harm. Uh, some of these um, are methods used for what they call mechanical extraction of venom. They don't work because like, for example, in mamba bites, the bite is so deep and into the lymphatic or blood system that you cannot, you cannot extract it in any way. So this will not work. Uh, we have seen patients with multiple superficial incisions, suctions to try and bleed out the venom. But again, if anything, they're just introducing infection and probably this is a patient who may not even have been envenomed, but now he will be with you uh, trying to treat infections from the lacerations. Often we see a lot of patients coming with very tight tourniquets and they may have been on, on the limbs for long hours and that can, can um, affect the circulation in the distal part of the limb. So these are also highly discouraged. Those Blackstone is very popular, but unfortunately it does not work. It's been proved. There have been studies done all over the world, but not, none of the studies has come out with anything showing that the black stone actually works. If anything, it's, it just, it's hygroscopic. So it's, it will stick on the blood. And then as soon as the blood dries, it falls off. And then people assume that, oh, it has sucked the venom. It doesn't work at all. This one shocked me. I saw it in one of our country referral host, county referral hospitals. They were actually um, lend, uh, they were giving out the, the black stone at 100 shillings. And I found that very strange. Now, this is, we talked about people who put their hands in holes. This is a young man who put his hand in a hole and he did not beat him but he assumed it was a snake. So what he did, he took, he took some charcoal and burnt that area. But from what you see, most likely there was no, it was not a snake bite and he just ended up having a bands on his, on, on his finger. Uh, these are also things that are sold in the market. This is called snake oil, white wheat. Uh, the whoever markets it says it works, but um, it has not been proven to work. So the stages of management in uh, snake bites, uh, it's important to have first aid, transport the patient to the hospital, rapid clinical assessment and resuscitation, depending on the condition of the patient, detailed clinical assessment and species diagnosis, Investigations and laboratory tests will be very important. Antivenom treatment, if required, observing uh, response to antivenom because people also do react to antivenoms. Deciding whether further doses of antivenom are needed. Uh, the patient will require supportive or ancillary treatment. Um, treatment of the beaten part, rehabilitation, and sometimes treatment of chronic complications. So those are the stages of management of segment. Um, so these essential first aid procedures again, um, by the victims themselves using uh, material available, arrange for transport to a medical facility, 
it's very, very important to reassure the victim because they are usually terrified and move the patient to safety to avoid more bites. Uh, remove any constricting clothing, rings, bracelets, bands from the bitten ring because if the patient has painful progressive swelling, then they, it will be very difficult to remove them later. Immobilize the whole patient, especially the bitten part using a splint because muscular contractions will promote absorption and spread of venom from the bite side via the veins and lymph, lymphatics. Um, there, was, there is the pressure immobilization technique, which was um, established by Sutherland in Australia in 1979. But this demands special equipment and training, and it's not considered practicable for general use in Africa. Um, you need to lay the patient in recovery position to avoid vomiting. Um, yeah, and sometimes you might need to give him uh, chlorpromazine. Now, it's very important to ask the patient which parts, there, there are four fundamental questions that you need to ask the patient. Eh? Uh, which part of the body have you been bitten? You need to look out for fang marks, bruises or bleeding or evidence of pre-hospital treatment or any evidence of descending paralysis. The second question is when were you bitten? Um, some patients come early before the development of symptoms and signs of envenoming, while others arrive late with complications, gangrene, pneumonia, acute kidney injury, or renal failure. Uh, where is the snake that beat you? There are some patients who arrive with the snake, which they have killed. They spend quite a bit of time trying to kill it, but if they have seen it, um, they might describe it, though most of the descriptions might not be very accurate. Um, like if, for example, they saw if it was a cobra, they say cobras rear the hood uh, and any snake longer than uh, one meter would be either a green mamba or a boom slang. Um, then you need to ask the patient, how are you feeling now? Because um, you will establish whether it's feeling faintness, dizziness, or an indication of hypotension, shock, local pain, painful and light nodes. And uh, then you need to check out for details of pre-hospital treatment, whether the patient had a tonique on or whether they had been uh, given some uh, herbal medication. Again, reassurance at community level, very important. Check the history of snake bite and look for obvious evidence of fang, of, of bite marks, fang marks. Immobilize the whole patient as far as possible, especially the bitten limb. Arrange to transport the patient to medical care as quickly, safely, and passively as possible by motor vehicle, boat, bicycle, stretcher, ideally the patient should lie in recovery position. Discourage time-wasting and potentially dangerous traditional treatments such as tight ligatures, tonicates, incisions, suctions, application of herbs, eyes, chemicals, all those are just wasting time and, and uh, worsening the patient's condition. If the snake responsible has already been caught or killed, then it can be taken, but ensure the safety and avoid direct contact. Um, now, at the rural clinic, uh, since the treatment of severe envenoming is a medical emergency, that may require a range of medical skills, equipment, antivenom, and other medicines. Referral should be to the highest care, level of care and that is readily available. History and simple physical examination, local swelling, painful tender glands, persistent bleeding from the bite site, blood pressure, pulse rate, bleeding gums, nose, vomit. Uh, stool or urine, level of consciousness, drooping eyelids, and other signs of paralysis. You must do a 20-minute whole blood clotting test, which we'll look at later, a urine examination, important identity of the snake he brought in. Assess the need for referral. Um, you sh analgesics should be given by mouth where possible and avoid giving NSAIDs because of the possibility of promoting bleeding. If an antivenom is indicated and available, um, and watch out for early signs of anaphylaxis. In case of respiratory paralysis, please give oxygen by mask and transfer the host to a hospital. Discourage the use of ineffective, in potentially harmful medicines. At this stage, you can't use corticosteroids, antihistamines, and heparins. Heparin. Uh, at the district hospital, that's the county hospital now we call it, more detailed clinical and laboratory assessment, including biochemical and hematological measurements, ECG or radiography as indicated. If no venom is 
no antivenom is available, transfer the patient to a hospital that has antivenom to treat conservatively. This may require transfusion of blood or fresh frozen plasma, reassess analgesia, and if required, consider stronger opioid medicines as required, with, but all with great caution. If the patient has evidence of local necrosis, give tetanus toxoid booster, uh, antibiotics, and consider surgical debridement of dead tissue. If the patient has evidence of bulbar or respiratory paralysis, then he might need to be intubated or a laryngeal mass airways. If there's evidence of respiratory failure, assist ventilation manually by anesthetic or ambu bag or mechanical ventilator. If the patient has evidence of acute renal failure, treat with peritoneal dialysis. If this is not available, transfer the patient to a specialized hospital. If the patient is bleeding severely or is seriously anemic, consider blood transfusion and a simple rehabilitation exercising of the bitten limb. Um, now, at the higher level hospitals, you get more advanced surgical management of local necrosis, which might be split skin grafting, if you got a, a cytotoxic bite. More advanced investigations include bacterial cultures and imaging, as indicated. If the patient has evidence of acute renal failure, peritoneal or hemodialysis or hemofiltration are, are, um, should be considered. Uh, the patient should be re rehabilitated by physiotherapists at that high level of hospital. So now we look at the key diagnostic features. Eh? It's important to know the time and geographical location. If the snake was seen, color, pattern, and length, though this is deceptive sometimes. Did the patient get single or multiple bites? Was first aid applied? Um, if there are symptoms suggestive of envenomation, you see fang marks, you see bleeding, headache, blood vision, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, collapse, convulsions. Um, in neurotoxicity, you would see uh, ptosis. Um, it's also important to find out whether the patient has had any prior exposure to antivenom. Uh, if the patient is on any medications, except uh, like anticoagulants, uh, locally, bite site, swelling bruises, discoloration, blistering rapidity, and extent of the swelling. Some may be caused by even the venous tonique. Uh, look at, examine the patient thoroughly. Generally, look at the lymph nodes locally. Uh, check his pulse. BP is op often quite high in uh, systemic envenomation. Uh, specifically, in diagnostic signs, you'd find myolysis, myolysis, renal impairment, cardiac and pulmonary impairments in painful progressive swelling. You will find paralysis, ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, cyanosis, cyanosis in uh, progressive weakness, and coagulopathy or ecchymosis in bleeding syndrome. Now, this is a test that should be done at every medical facility when, when you get any patient with a snake bite. It's called a 20 minute whole blood clotting test. You don't need a laboratory to do that. You just need a clean, dry, new glass test tube. Then you take two ml of blood, uh, place it uh, without stirring it, place it on the bench for about 20 minutes and observe if it clots within 20, 20 to 30 minutes, then, then there is no hemorrhagic syndrome. Um, because we get quite a lot of patients who um, have a bleeding syndrome from puffed bites. So patients with painful progressive swelling, especially, but ideally any patient who comes and does not know what's neck bitten, do a 20 minute whole blood clotting test. It can save a lot of things because if there's lack, if there's a, a, a there is a, the clot is not forming, then uh, you are at risk of hemorrhagic syndrome. Uh, in the laboratory, you can do full blood counts, platelets, and lymphocytes, renal functions, urinalysis is very important, especially in painful progressive swelling. If the kidneys may have been affected, electrolytes, urea creatinine, uh, creatinine kinase, uh, PTINR, PTT, fibrinogen, um, D-dimers, you can also do that. Uh, in Australia, there's a very interesting um, kit for testing. It's called Venom Detecting Kit. It, it, they use um, 
either blood or, or, or urine to check for venoms. And it's very specific for particular venoms. So, so that when they have to give an antivenom, they're giving a specific antivenom for treatment. Okay, now we get to the management of painful progressive syndrome. Most of the bites actually do not need antivenom. You just need to give fluids, elevation, analgesia. If, if the swelling is actively progressing, and that's why it's very important that any snake bite patient should actually be observed ideally for 24 hours. So if there is potential severe envenomation, swelling extending at 15 or more centimeters for an hour, or swelling getting to the elbow or knee by three hours, then you start getting worried. It's important that you think about probably having to give antivenom. If there is severe envenomation present, swelling of the whole limb within eight hours, swelling threatening the airway, associated unexplained dyspnea, associated coagulopathy, compartment syndrome or vessel entrapment, you may need to consider giving an anti an antivenom. Um, we also get regional complications um, in painful progressive swelling. So one of the complications that we get is compartment syndrome. But before you get the surgeons to to do uh, to do fasciotomy, it's important to make sure that there is no co coagulopathy, otherwise the patient might bleed to death. So um, you have to make sure that that is, it is corrected if it's, if, it's, if it's there, then the patient should be given manitol and uh, you reassess the patient. If, if it's not com controlled, then you might need to do uh, coagulopathy, uh, sorry, fasciotomy. Um, if there is a hematoma, you might need to drain it, but you also have to make sure that there is no coagulopathy. Um, if there's entrapment syndrome, you may need to do decompression of fasciotomy also if there's no co coagulopathy. But if there's no entrapment, you might just survive with conservative treatment. Um, in the management of progressive weakness, um, these are the suggested indications for antivenom. If the patient has pins and needles around the mouth, metallic test, dyspnea due to general asparesis in absence of painful progressive swelling, think about mamba bites and have antivenom ready just in case this patient may need it because this could progress to respiratory failure. Um, if the patient has painful progressive swelling as, as well as weakness, uh, it could be non-spitting cobras, or if he has been bitten at sea, it could be a sea snake. Um, if he has also inability to swallow saliva, think about starting to give antivenom, especially if, if you suspect that it's a mamba bite, do not waste time. Um, in the management of bleeding syndrome, um, again, antivenom is the main, is the main uh, drug that needs to be given, especially in active bleeding. But again, it's also important to know which snake has caused that because there are some snakes which are only treated by a monovalent antivenom because like a boom slang, you have to treat with boom slang specific antivenom. Any of the polyvalent antivenoms that we have on the Kenyan market do not work at all. So, um, Snake bite in uh, pregnancy. Again, pregnancy is not a contraindication of, of, um, of giving uh, antivenom. In early pregnancy, uh, you just have to follow up for congenital abnormalities. At any stage of pregnancy, whether it's progressive weakness or progressive pain for progressive swelling, you must treat the mother on merit and, but ensure adequate oxygenation and feed resuscitation. Otherwise, it might also harm the the fetus. Uh, if there's any coagulopathy, you may need to give antivenom to prevent abruption to placenta, abortion or stillbirth or maternal death. Um, instead of adrenaline, uh, we give, because as a premedication, in most in snake bites, we actually give, um, we give adrenaline, but 
In pregnancy, adrenaline is not indicated because it may cause vasoconstriction. So we give ephedrine instead. Uh, remember that the the spitting cobras the 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 spitting cobras aim mainly for the eyes. Um, so uh, venom ophthalmia, which is when you get the venom into the eyes, can cause blepharospasm, conjunctivitis, chemosis, and possible corneal erosions. And in the management, it is very important to immediately irrigate the eyes with water or any other bland solution. It has even been uh, proved that if, if this happened in the bush where there was no water, if you can get urine in the eyes, that could, could actually clear that for the moment until the patient gets to, to hospital uh, or to a medical practitioner. Um, as a medical practitioner, the patient might need an application of local an anesthetic eye drops because the eyes are very, they, they are very irritating. And um, if, if you do slit lamp and there are no corneal erosions, an antibiotic eye ointment would be enough and an iPad. And then resolution normally happens within 24 to 48 hours. Um, if, if the corneal erosions are present, then the patient might need to see an ophthalmologist and of course get initially antibiotic eye drops. But antivenom is not indicated even whether diluted and steroids are contraindicated in uh, venom ophthalmia. So that is what the patients look like with venom, of, of, venom ophthalmia. Those are the clinical presentations. Next, please. Um, okay, these are generally, again, the indications for antivenom. In coagulable blood, there's spontaneous systemic bleeding, serious neurotoxic signs, hypotension, shock, cardiac arrhythmia, or abnormal ECG, local swelling involving more than half of the bitten limb, rapid extension of swelling beyond the wrist or ankle within a few hours of the bite. If the victim is a child with any of most minor signs of toxicity, and, um, but again, please make sure that there is a proper indication for giving uh, an antivenom because let us not rush to give antivenoms. Now, this is just a summary of what I have been talking about, about the indications for antivenom. It's all together in one algorithm. But again, the treatment here with, is with uh, South African vaccine producers antivenom, which is not available in the Kenyan market. But um, I used to use it a lot while, uh, uh, because the Biochem Snake Farm used to import some for their own use, and that's where most of the, my patients used to come to, and I would manage them using South African venom, uh, South African vaccine producers antivenom. Uh, okay, now this test, this is very important, especially in, um, unfortunately, of all the antivenoms that we have available, there is none for treatment of Egyptian cobra bites. So if anybody is treated by Egyptian cobra bites, just know that there is no available antivenom at the moment. So what you might need to use it's an anticholinesterase test, which may be valuable in neurotoxic envenomation. So you do the baseline observations and uh, confirm that the patient has actually been uh, envenomed. Uh, then you give atropine to prevent the mascarinic effects of acetylcholine. Um, then you'll give an anticholinesterase drug, hydrofonium chloride or neostigmine, which is, uh, it is widely available. And um, you might give an ampule over three to four minutes and observe the patient for the next 10 or 30 minutes, 10 to 30 minutes for evidence of improvement. 
but you might need to repeat this over, but still it will also be important to give other support because the patient might require ventilatory support. So you might need, if you might need, um, you might need to uh, give oxygen either by bag and mask or you might need to intubate the patient. So uh, these are the other drugs for management of snake bites. Um, steroids have only been used to prevent or, or, or to treat serum sickness. Uh, those are delayed reactions to antivenom. But if, if it's given, normally there's no good evidence for efficacy for diminishing local and systemic effects and interferes with venom and antivenom reactions and it might delay wound healing. NSAIDs delay wound healings and can actually cause more bleeding, especially in patients with bleeding syndrome. And uh, they predispose to necrotizing fasciitis. Antihistamines have almost no effect, uh, except chlorpheniramine, which can be given uh, when the patient gets um, um, anaphylactic, anaphylactoid reactions from antivenom, which are very common, the kind of antivenoms that we have. Um, but does not reduce the in incidence of acute adverse reactions to antivenom. Next, please. Uh, the possible causes of death, uh, they could be due to, uh, in painful progressive swelling, they could be due to hypovolemic shock, uh, toxicity due to a dead limb, uh, swelling affecting the mediastinum, pulmonary function, the airways, they could be due to acute renal failure, uh, bleeding in Pafada, consumption coagulopathy, pulmonary edema in, in uh, Gabun Adabites. Um, in progressive weakness, the patient could die of hypoxia or complications of ventilation. And uh, bleeding syndrome, there could be bleeding and multiple organ failure. Uh, this is just something I put in between being afraid of snakes is fine, but killing snakes because you're afraid is never okay. Next, please. Okay, lastly, I think we'll now talk quickly talk about venoms and anti-venoms. Um, venoms, you know, a lot of people equate venoms to poisons, but venoms and poisons are different. Venoms are a mixed, complex mixture of proteins and peptides. Whereas poisons are diverse types of chemicals, including steroids, alkaloids, and amines. The venoms are produced ex exclusively by animals, snakes, spiders, scorpions, centipedes, stingrays, stonefish, jellyfish, etc. But, and they are manufactured in specialized glands. And they have a special mechanism for delivering the venom into the prey. For snakes, it's fangs, some fish have spines, jellyfish have nematocysts, and some venoms have digestive property. Whereas, uh, poisons are passively acquired toxins produced by both plants and animals and may have an unpleasant taste or smell, may be lethal if ingested. Uh, snake venoms are a complex mixture of toxic and non-toxic components. The most important venom components that lead to significant clinical effects after bites are enzymes and polypeptide toxins. The important properties are for prey mobilization, digestion, defense. They have a 90% 90 per, 90 of the dry weight is protein. The amount of venom injected during a bite depends on the species size of the snake, mechanical efficiency of the bite, whether one or two fangs penetrated the skin, whether there were repeated bites, because even after several bites, snakes do not exhaust their venom. So don't think that after, you, after it has bitten somebody, it, you are safe to handle it. So this is just um, a picture of, uh, of, 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 of a venomous snake. You can see that is the venom gland. It comes out into the fangs. The fangs are like a hypodermic needle. So this is what they are used for injecting the venom into, into the prey. Um, snakes venom vary in their composition from species to species, but also with a single species. And they vary throughout the geographical distribution of that species at different seasons of the year as the snake gets older. So the most important venom components, uh, uh, and, and this is important, especially in, when you are making the anti-venom, you need to mix venom from the young snakes, old snakes, 
and snakes from the same geographical area, but if it's Kenya, you need a snake from coast province and similar snake from Nyanza and another one from central province, you need to get their venoms. Um, so the most important venom components that cause serious clinical effects are one, uh, procoagulant enzymes, which are found in vipers, uh, cytolytic and necrotic toxins are the digestive hydrolysis, uh, hemolytic and myolytic uh, phospholipases A2, paralytic neurotoxins, all these are found in, uh, in, 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 uh, in venom, presynaptic neurotoxins, postsynaptic neurotoxins, dendrotoxins, and fasciculins. You also find hemorrhagins, which cause a lot of bleeding, biogenic amines, which are histamine-like. Um, antivenom is the only specific antidote for an venom. Venom of a single species snake may vary in composition and antigenicity. Pooled venom from different parts of the geographical range may be used for antivenom production, including younger specimens, as I had said before. Next, please. So there are two, there, there, are, um, there are three types of, of antivenom. There are the whole IgG antivenom, there's FAB2 and FAB, which are refined fragments of, of IgG, FAB2 and FAB, uh, because they remove this factor FC, which causes major antivenom anti reactions. Um, then the antivenom is either lyophilized, but it's more expensive to do that, or stored at, as a liquid. But again, you need the cold chain because it will be stored at two to eight centimeters. There are two types of uh, antivenoms. There are polyspecific or polyvalent antivenoms derived from animals hyperimmunized against venoms of several snake species. Those known to be of greatest medical importance in the area where antivenom is intended to be used. Uh, this allows for syndromic management where the snake identity is uncertain. But unfortunately, we have had antivenoms come into this country using venoms from different continents. And they, they have no effect at all, but they have been used in this country, which is very sad. Um, we have monospecific antivenoms derived from animals immunized against the venom of a single snake species. But now this requires precise knowledge before you give the antivenom. Uh, anti Um, as we said earlier, uh, antivenom neutralizes a fixed amount of antivenom. And uh, since snakes inject the same amount of venom into adults and children, the same dose is used. You don't use a lesser dose for children. Um, antivenom is scarce and expensive and might have potentially serious effects. So it should be admitted only if there is threat to life and limb. And also it's administered, it, so these are the expected benefits of antivenom, efficacy, systemic and local, tolerance, immediate adverse effects. There are delayed adverse effects. It should be stable during uh, in our climatic conditions and it should be accessible and affordable and, and not just available in isolated centers. So again, antivenom is indicated in all cases of systematic, uh, systemic and local envenoming. There are no absolute contraindications. However, patients with atopic history uh, may, or previous re reactions to equine sera have an increased risk of severe reactions. So you have to be very careful when you're dealing with such patients. That's why it's important to get proper history before even giving the antivenom. Children can get the same dose as adults. Uh, hypersensitivity test is not predictive of early anaphylactic reactions. Um, so again, here we are repeating monospecific if species is, an, is known polyspecific in an area where a number of different species produce similar clinical effects. Intravenous administration is the most effective. Uh, Lyophilized anti, uh, antivenom should be resolved in 10 minutes. Infusion is usually over 30 to 60 minutes. IM injection is not recommended because of the risk of 
hematoma formation. And uh, it's always important to look at the guidelines for the dosage of antivenoms that we have in the country. So response to antivenoms, neurotoxic signs change slowly. So you still need to give the patient supportive uh, treatment with oxygen, especially. Uh, cardiovascular effects such as hypotension may respond within 10 to 20 minutes. Um, spontaneous bleeding usually stops quite fast within 15 to 30 minutes. Um, the 20 minute whole blood clotting test would be very important to, to use for monitoring the bleeding. Um, if the blood remains incoagulable six hours after the first dose, then the dose should be repeated and so on every six hours until the coagulability, coagulability is restored. Uh, I think that's okay, next please. So these are the four registered products, antivenoms we have in Kenya. There's Ekitab, not Ekitab, Ekitab Plus. I see this is from Costa Rica. Uh, it's only effective against so scale viper and spitting cobras. Inosap um, is also polyvalent. It's available. Panav Premium is available. Vins is available. These are the ones that are available for use in this country. Um, and management of adverse reactions to antivenom. Adverse reactions usually occur within a few minutes, but may delay it for up to six hours. Uh, usually there's pyrexia, rash, itching of the skull, particaria, or severe acute dyspnea, hypotension, bronchospasm, angioedema. Um, we have late serum sick sickness, which when there'll be fever, urticaria, polylymphadenopathy, polyarthritis, hematuria. Um, Normally, we give adrenaline and chlorpheniramine, and these go away. So, but we look at it in the next slide. So, in early anaphylactoid reactions or anaphylactic reactions, stop the antivenom temporarily. Give adrenaline, and this is the time you may also have to give some hydrocortisone. But as soon as the symptoms disappear, you may you still need to give the antivenom if the patient has been envenomed. Um, if, if he has pyrogenic reactions, you can do tepid sponging and give antipyretics. Uh, Let serum sickness after antivenom treatment is usually treated with prednisone. Um, again, we said uh, venous access might be a problem um, in children, but sometimes the intraosseous route may be required. Um, yeah. Now, a big problem that we have in this country, like many other African countries, is the issue with traditional uh, healers. Traditional healers held in high esteem in most African communities and play a large role in village-based treatment of many illnesses, including snake bites. There is need to educate traditional practitioners in evidence-based snake bite management and to make use of the trust and belief members of the community have in them. It should be emphasized that in many cases of snake bite, traditional healing procedures have resulted in delayed transfer of victims to healthcare facilities, thus increasing the risk of death and permanent sequel. Traditional healers should therefore be encouraged not to delay the victims transfer to the health facility. They should be discouraged from engaging in practices that may endanger their lives, especially where efficacy has not been established. These include incisions applying the black snake, uh, tie tonics and administering and proven herbal remedies. To date, no herbal or traditional remedy for snake bites has been proved effective in clinical trials. To validate, validate if efficacy of African traditional treatment, properly designed scientific research needs to be instigated. And that's where the Ministry of Health, I think, needs to come in. And we need to talk to these traditional healers. We need to talk one voice so that we can get the uh, victims coming in in time uh, so we can so that it's possible to achieve the roadmap of of reducing death and disability by half by the year 2030 according to the who yeah so i think this is the last slide um so these are the who guidelines you can get them online 
for prevention and clinical management of snake bites in Africa. Then these are our local guidelines, which are also available online. Um, once you just type in that guidelines for prevention and diagnosis and management of snake bite environment in Kenya, you'll get them and you can have a look at them. So I think that, thank you very much. And uh, sorry for the delay in the beginning, but uh, I would be happy to answer some questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, surprisingly, you've answered the majority of the questions because uh, they ask and then you give the answer, especially like, for example, the black stone on tetanus toxoid. However, maybe you can give us uh, where we can get antivenoms in Kenya in, in different regions where they can be accessed? Uh, now, in fact, I think the county, the county hospitals are getting from KEMSA. I think KEMSA is the one which is supplying. Because the other day I got a big supply of Inosap from KEMSA and sadly it's almost expiring. I don't know where it has been. So I think through the county hospitals and KEMSA, they should be able to avail antivenom. But again, one thing that I must say, there is one antivenom that I, I told you I used to use, the South African one, but unfortunately it has not been registered for use in this country. So it is, but I find that quite effective, especially for, for our Kenyan snakes. I did find that quite effective. Ah, interesting. I didn't know it was available with Kemsa. Then how many, how many people have specialized in snake bites and do we have short courses available on this? Because I can see it's generated a lot of questions and uh, what people wanting to know more. No, I think mine was just accidental because I landed in a place where we had snakes and, uh, and I used to see snake bite victims. And then actually the courses that I did I did a course in Australia um, on management of snake bites, but I have not heard of any available course locally. One of the listeners, weirdly, is also an Australian. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, um, a lot of people have been asking about the tourniquets when to do it. Maybe you can give that as, as the final question. Now, the tourniquets, you know, you have to be very careful about it. It's, before, you are, before the tourniquet is applied, it's important to know what kind of bite it is. If it is a neurotoxic bite, then you can get away with it. But if it's a cytotoxic bite, then you know you, you're the... the the neurotoxic bite, it would, it would prevent the spread of venom into the system. But a cytotoxic bite would just worsen the, the, the swelling and the bleeding bite will not help anything. So you have to be very careful about when to, to apply the tonic. Nice. Uh, thank you so much. So for the viewers uh, who have asked about the presentation. This uh, recording is always available on the KNH website. There's also a YouTube channel of KNH Research where you can access the video and listen to the conversation from beginning to end. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali, so much for your precious time. You've had a lot of engagement from the audience uh, from different parts of the world. I can see India, Australia, and many people from your time. I know um, it's been very hectic for you to arrange this. So thank you very much. Um, any passing shots? Yeah, and thank you very much for listening. You see, like I said, um, we now, especially after establishing the, the guidelines, we really need to put some training, especially in our medical institutions so that we can get more people trained at least to, to management of snake bites because it's a problem that had been forgotten. But I think uh, if it was not for COVID, I think it would have gone probably a step further towards what, what the WHO had planned. 
thank you. And quickly, I also Google the, the guideline. I can see it's available on the KNA uh, website, uh, not MOH, as previously stated. Thank you very much, everybody. I will see you in the next uh, session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.